But it was great in Eugene's talk to um, hear public media kind of called out in this way, both, um, you know, we're sort of used to in our travelings within the public media world to either be beating up on ourselves or patting our own back and to um, hear called out in a way that actually sets up um, a, a promise and a purpose within the context of the broadband plan um, and to point the way to this discussion which is going to try to talk about some of the challenges of this transition that we as a, uh, an industry are in um, and not dissimilar to some other um, media moments that are happening. So uh, my name is Jake Shapiro. I'm executive director of PRX, the Public Radio Exchange. In many ways, uh, we're one of these born digital um, new public media enterprises. Uh, uh, we operate as an open distribution platform connecting independent producers with local stations, really as a hybrid between broadcast and digital opportunities, um, and trying to focus on the intersection of technology and talent, really trying to nurture new voices and content. Um, and there's been a long-term interest in this topic of the transition of public broadcasting and public media into uh, the participatory culture. Uh, it's, uh, we're at a nexus of opportunities. We see disruption in other media industries that we have observed in music in particular, which has been an interest of, of ours, um, and in newspapers that I know the Knight Foundation's report has really focused on where that's um, coming up. Um, to, to Eugene's point about um, mediated versus unmediated, uh, I think one of the themes I'm hoping will emerge from this conversation is if you take seriously the role of being a mediator still in this age, um, how are we addressing that um, through the, the public media system? A word about when we're describing public media, there's definitional issues that are bound to come up. Um, we have here with us really a group of public broadcasters, um, and in many ways we're, I think, all discussing public media as radiating out from and well beyond the boundaries of what public broadcasting has traditionally been constituted to be, um, which can include and has been referenced um, public access television, low power FMs, um, other nonprofits engaged in uh, public service media activities. Uh, there's, there's an interesting question, especially as we get into some of the opportunities um, ahead, as to where some of those boundaries end up getting drawn, especially as you talk about potential reform or even legislation that might change some of the definitions. Um, so what I'd like to do, uh, you know, what, what's one thing about this panel is that rather than policymakers or policy observers or academics, we have a bunch of practitioners here who are really engaged in the day-to-day -day of building uh, a next kind of public media architecture, infrastructure, operations across a spectrum of roles. Um, so in order to get our heads around the opening of where this transition to a digital public media is headed. I'm going to ask each one to sort of introduce themselves and in doing so you know, address the topic as they'd like, but also talk about a project or a particular initiative that is illustrative of what we think um, this next incarnation of public media might be. And I guess I'll just start to my left, so please introduce yourself, Rob. Sure. Uh, Robert Bull. I'm with the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and my role is to lead our digital strategy and investments. Um, I think one of the central themes that I see, and I, I'm relatively new to public broadcasting. I came from an organization that worked in public media with low-income populations and then moved into this role about 10 months ago. And one of the great things that I, I see happening, one of the reasons why I was so attracted to coming over and working in public broadcasting is this, uh, the two, two mediating influences. One was that you have the power to broadcast. The power to broadcast means that you can reach everyone in the United States uh, with free and uh, universally accessible content in general. And that, that is not necessarily true in the digital world, that, that digital content costs money to get access to and to, to utilize. So the ability to mix broadcast and digital platforms seemed to be, to be a great opportunity for where public media is going. I also saw organizations and people like these that were starting to turn public media uh, uh, from a purely broadcast environment to a more of a platform approach where there was other types of collaborations, other types of voices, and other top, uh, types of opportunities to get uh, information out into the, into the world um, that are non-traditional. And so those two things are, are sort of in full swing. Uh, in terms of, I so desperately want to talk about the public media platform, but I know Kinsey's going to want to talk about that. Um, but I, I, I want to talk about one thing that I think is um, 
a, a little uh, unusual or it's a little changing, and that is what some of the role of where PRX and where a number of other folks are in developing um, a series of very flexible applications, whether they're on mobile platforms or online, that allow people to engage and participate. Uh, WNYC is a good example of that in New York that's doing work about sort of uncommon economic indicators where they're actually asking people from the community to start to crowdsource knowledge about what's happening in their community. It's all centralized around a broadcast, a radio broadcast, um, but it is being visualized on the online space, which is generating even more broadcast. Uh, so that opportunity to really sort of have this engaged conversation in, in that space is really adding a great value, and it's an example of very flexible, uh, very agile tools coming to bear in, a, in an industry, a broadcast industry, which can also mean a lot of capital uh, and a lot of inflexibility because some of the rules around that broadcast. So there's a lot of very interesting sort of dynamic happening. Uh, I'm Marita Rivero. I'm a vice president at uh, WGBH, the public broadcaster here, and I'm the general manager for radio and television, <laughs> which now means you're the general manager for mobile video, broadband, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I find this uh, a moment of great opportunity and, uh, and interest. Uh, so while we started in public broadcasting thinking about radio and, and television, it's been well over a decade uh, since the work we've done uh, really has moved on to create specific projects for for many uh, media devices and using many tools. So I think I'm here from the perspective of uh, producers, kind of the, edit, the editorial side of, uh, of what's happening in, in public broadcasting. And um, Jake suggested I use as an example a large national project that, that we're beginning to uh, work on called World 2.0, um, which is an online uh, civic engagement project. Um, uh, we're really asking the public to help us define some of the issues of the day. Uh, uh, and we're really looking at how we might target, in fact, younger, a younger, I'll point a finger at 36, but a younger population of people um, uh, and put in, from, in front of uh, that group uh, opportunities to begin to become more engaged and share information about what's happening. When I was thinking about this, I wrote down, you know, four or five things that I think are distinctive as we as public broadcasters, the traditional public broadcasters, have engaged over this time. Um, I think we use our strengths as curators. When, when, uh, you know, when we talk about news and journalism, news is the primary example of curation. Uh, and we're past grandmasters at taking very complicated issues and be able to present them back in ways that allow people to address them and digest them. Um, public broadcasters have a national base as we've done work with many of the new media providers uh, and partnered with new media providers, we realize one of the strengths we bring is that there are stations and communities all across the country. Uh, and being able to partner outside public, traditional public broadcasting means that we share a number of things, but one of them is that particular reach. Um, we can use our current investments. That's what this project imagines. We put money into building the National Black Programming Consortium. And that consortium has connections with the African-American community all across the country. Um, there are opportunities for us to take investments that we've made in that and many other communities that we've developed over time and think about how we bring them back together, reformat them, uh, using the capabilities we have now to have that voice part of the issues. Um, obviously, we're looking at, at creating a grammar that attracts people. That's what we do. We, we try to take some of the data and the things that might otherwise be dry and turn them into uh, the possibility of bringing people in. Uh, if we can't do that, we're out of the, we're out of the business. Um, and finally, I just say that, you know, we're looking at, at um, obviously right now, a kind of transmedia and really distributed model of, of uh, programming. So these are, these are kind of five areas that I think uh, some of them are unique to public broadcasters, uh, established public broadcasting. But for us, they've all been part of what we've been uh, experimenting with and, uh, and what we're intending to bring into the World 2.0 uh, project to look at a broader group of people coming together to uh, empower themselves and talk about the issues of the day. Thank you. I'm Sue Sharp. I'm the executive director of AIR, which is based here in Dorchester. It's the Association of Independence in Radio. 
Uh, it's an organization that's 21 years old. It's one of the oldest and largest um, membership, professional membership organizations in public media. And um, what we um, have, in, is just briefly in terms of the organization, um, it's a very broad um, group um, spanning ages from about 18 to 70 years old. Um, we have uh, practitioners who have been in the business for 35 plus years who helped lay down the pipelines from the earliest days of the industry to the youngest and most emerging um, group of uh, media um, practitioners. Hope, and hopefully we can talk more about that a little bit later. Um, we had a project this last year, Maker's Quest 2.0, funded by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting that was a tremendous demonstration project. Um, CPB came to us and asked us to help uh, figure out how producers, how individual inspired producers could help lead the industry through the transition from public radio to public media. And what we saw emerge was uh, really some just tremendous fodder and tremendous information and models for us. Um, briefly, I would welcome, um, invite you to look, there's a brief video at mq2.org, which will give you more of a scope on the projects. But um, briefly, what the principle behind the project is that um, the change is happening from the bottom up. It's individuals who are leading the change. It's the craftspeople who are leading, um, who are on the front edge, and front edge of what's happening. And so what we did was we basically turned to them and uh, you know these nimble, not risk averse, um, very crafty people who figure stuff out for a living um, and said to them, how can we blend traditional platforms, the power of the converged audience that we have in public radio, which is tremendous, with these new digital, this new circulation system, these new di digital tools and pathways. Uh, we gave them five months, we gave them $40,000 each, and they came, <clears throat> I won't, again, won't go into detail here, but what we saw come out of this were they invented new formats, participatory documentary, uh, documentary that went, went into the communities. Um, we partnered them each with incubators, so they, they were incubated, uh, sort of seated, four of them at NPR, one of them at KPCC in Los Angeles, one at KUOW in Seattle, WNYC. And so they had this relationship, but retained their independence and their freedom to invent. Um, that, so that, that's a project that uh, I would say demonstrates the new face uh, of the public media journalists, where we still see these uh, gifted individuals, again, of varying degrees of experience, too. Some were very inexperienced and some were much more experienced. But basically, in the role still, as Jake is mentioning, as a mediator, still the person who is gifted at identifying good stories and good storytellers and then figuring out how to get that story out. But the whole landscape in terms of the tools that they can use is what's changed, and this is what the, this is what they figured out. They don't have to go out with the microphone themselves and ask somebody a question and gather half an hour of tape and go back and cut it up into four minutes and, you know, put it out on the radio station. It's a whole different participatory uh, uh, model. These are participatory models that they invented that that are tremendously exciting. Hi, I'm Kinsey Wilson. I'm Senior Vice President and General Manager of Digital Media at NPR, um, which means that about half of my time is spent sort of on the operations of NPR's digital media operations, and the other half is sort of <coughs> gazing into the future and trying to figure out what NPR's future and its station's future digital strategy will be. Um, I've been in journalism for 30 years, been in digital media for about 15, and like Rob, I'm relatively new to public media, having been there about 15 months. Um, a couple of the speakers made reference to the, the, the enormous technological disruption that's going on. And for us, from where we sit, it's, it's created both an imperative and an opportunity. Uh, the imperative Eugene referred to in terms of, of public broadcasting having to move from sort of its 20th century analog broadcasting model to its 21st century digital future and make sure that it can make that transition. The opportunity is one that, that I think has become much more evident just in the last couple of years uh, as both 
the technological transformation has accelerated and the challenges to the business model around journalism have, have become accentuated. And um, we see an opportunity that um, one of our board members at a, at a meeting the other day summed up as saying um, that we need stronger, more vibrant news organizations in more places. Um, I would add to that that reach larger and more diverse audiences across all platforms. It's, it's an ambition that even just a couple of years ago uh, probably would have been beyond the scope of public media, but because the technologies and the tools have become lighter and because uh, monopoly or near monopoly news organizations that completely dominated the local market are beginning to see their franchise erode and the opportunity is opening up for lots of different players to come in. Uh, there is a real opportunity for public media to step into that space. So our efforts have been focused really in two directions, to try and um, help stations figure out what the best opportunity is in that space and where the appropriate uh, divide is, if you will, between services and guidance that can be provided at a national level uh, and economies of scale that can be provided at a national level and where uh, the opportunity is best left to the bottom-up uh, kind of creativity uh, that Sue was describing. And so we've got two projects underway. Uh, one is aimed at sort of uh, understanding the audience proposition. What, what will attract people? What is the best editorial journalistic uh, audience play for public media in these local markets? Because there are lots of different choices that you can make. And uh, it's very hard for individual properties to figure that out one by one. So we're trying to provide some guidance there and have a project underway in 12 different markets that actually launched today with the uh, signing of a contract uh, with the CPB around that that will uh, be attempting to, in essence, do rapid prototyping over the next two years of uh, some local news sites in those markets. The other... Um, sort of trailing behind that but began with uh, what Eugene referred to as the NPR API is an effort to create a common platform and think about networking public media content, however that's ultimately defined, in some sort of common repository. The larger goal of which is to encourage the kind of innovation uh, that needs to go on at the local level to, in, in essence, stimulate open source development on top of that repository and give people uh, the tools with which to invent the next generation of news gathering. So one piece is, is sort of intellectually focused on what the audience proposition is, the other very much on infrastructure and platform and common standards and economies of scale. So. In a way that sounds almost, uh, it's just striking me now with an analogy to what might be the collected assets of public media made available through an open platform is the, is the data.gov proposition where then you hope um, and in fact encourage further innovation to happen on top of that collected content. Um, and then the sources of that content, unlike not being government sources, this is um, where I think the conversation gets interesting is when, when you're talking about the first incarnation of the platform, you're thinking about NPR content or the related partners, national producers. Um, but then we might get to where Sue's purview into a much broader range of individual creators or others who are not necessarily holders of licenses to bits of spectrum. Um, so one question that I would like anybody to jump in on, go through, um, first is, as we think about this transition, um, we've talked about a few of the assets already that we bring forward with it, existing knowledge and expertise even in storytelling and this mediation role. Um, some powerful relationships, community organizations across the country um, that are already in place and providing valued service over broadcast. Um, one of the ones also that is interesting in uh, contrast to the declining trust in other institutions nationally, government, Congress being examples that were just brought up, is the trust in public media brands, the ones that are best known, is actually very high and in many ways growing. Um, but what, if you were looking at it, and the two of you who are newest to the system, as we call the system, might have particular insight in this, uh, are, the, are the hindrances. We have, you know, you can mention another asset that maybe I didn't mention that we're bringing in, but what are the ones that you actually see as obstacles to public broadcasting playing a fundamental role in the new space? All right. Um, <laughs> you guys got it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think there, I think there are two that I would I would cite. I think one of the Rita, you were talking about one of the great um, sorry about that, one of the great 
assets of public broadcasting is localism. And I think one of the uh, great challenges of public broadcasting is localism, um, meaning that uh, we have 800 plus independent businesses with their own boards, with their own uh, uh, you know, balance sheets, with their own infrastructure that um, can work together, uh, have the opportunity to work together, but sometimes it's hard. So you have uneven distribution of capacity whether it's a small little radio station done by two people in Marfa, Texas, to GBH or some of the larger producing stations. So I think that's one of the, one of the big challenges, and I think CPB's role in that challenge, as well as NPR and PBS and other, other big organizations, is to start to make some systematic wide investments in things that Kinsey was talking about in terms of uh, uh, public media platforms. And another project I would cite, which would be one that I'm um, working on is called the American Archive, which is not a, a news-based archive, though I think Eugene's point about helping and trying to uh, help improve the ability for people to get access to journalism content is very important. <laughs> the American Archive is a much larger uh, archive than just journalism. And we have, to, we have to understand that public media is, uh, you know, something that is very much involved in education and arts and cultural life. And it's amazing, actually. I have a little thing right now for the American Playhouse, if anyone remembers that. I just got a book with all of the American Playhouse productions. And it's, you know, it's every significant actor, producer, writer, or director in today's Hollywood scene has created, uh, over the age of 35, has created content for the American Playhouse series, like every single one. And they didn't do it for commercial interests. They didn't even really do it for themselves. They did it for the American public. But it's hard to get access to that material because of the myriad rights issues. So I think if I was going to uh, talk a little bit about some of the big challenges, it's, it's that question of how do you even capacity? And I think technology infrastructure, equal access to very robust, flexible technology infrastructure, um, whether it's something that is put together by an NPR or PBS working together, or whether it's something put together uh, by outside uh, entities like Google or Cisco or whatnot, are very important as well as this addressing of this digital rights issue. The American public has made significant investments in this fantastic stuff, but you know what? You can't get access to it. Just on, on the obstacle side, I guess, uh, to, to build on what Rob was saying, I, you know, as I look at sort of this transformation over the last 15 years, over and over again you see that, that the organizations that have the greatest difficulty are those whose um, legacy structure, governance, whatever, uh, profoundly inhibits their ability to sort of make this transition, to, to take the risks, uh, to make the investments that they need to because their, uh, their loyalties are divided or structurally they're simply not set up and organized to do this. And I, you know, clearly that's, that's one of the challenges that um, public media faces. I'm um, quite optimistic though, and particularly coming, having come out of the newspaper industry and having watched what occurred there, um, Public media is generally operating from a position of strength. Public radio's audience has grown 67 percent between 1998 and 2008, uh, while programming, uh, most other news programming, has declined on other platforms, traditional legacy platforms. Um, we are not rocked back on our heels as we're trying to make this transformation. We actually uh, enjoy trust, reach, um, a vibrant news organization, and can build from there, and I think have <laughs> Um, become aware of the necessity of moving quickly at a time when we're still strong and that um, unfortunately newspapers uh, when their cash flow was at its, at its zenith in 2002, 2003 uh, were not as quick to act and are now finding it very difficult to respond to the technological challenges that they face. Mm -hmm. Could I yeah, go ahead. Even though I'm not. Um, I would just add one sort of another um, dimension to what Kinsey is saying here. Um, in terms of the legacy and the culture. You know, a public radio is an institution that is a phenomenal success story. I mean, it's a 35-year-old institution that has basically just had straight, straight, straight growth in audience, in revenues, and in penetration, and just uh, evolving into the, the, you know, the very um, respected institution that it is. It boils down to the people and, and an understanding that the people who started this whole enterprise 35 years ago are in large part still the ones who are with it. They, they've ridden this wave. They're the architects of success. 
And here they are at a point at this incredibly, um, you know, this time where there's this tremendous seismic shift going on. And what they were hired to do and what they did extremely well was build this, uh, you know, this amazing institution. And now suddenly they're supposed to somehow, you know, change everything or, or, or help it through this whole transformation. And I think it's a really basic kind of um, awareness that we have to have that it, that's not, they did their job. It's not their job to necessarily come up with the transformation. The answer to the transformation and the agent, the agency of transformation isn't those who are sort of holding the, you know, sort of holding the keys to the kingdom. So there needs to be a very sort of, it's kind of simple, but it's a powerful kind of awareness that needs to happen within the institution. And I don't think our industry is alone. I'm sure this, this, is, this happens, you know, all the time um, with industries that, that enjoy tremendous success. It's really hard. Um, for those gatekeepers who did their job and they did it extremely well and who are sort of looking at, you know, retirement, you know, they're, they're, they're moving out. How to make that transition. The, the other thing I would just add quickly is that related to this is there's a tremendous gap in infrastructure and investment. Um, we have this, so we have this legacy at a t this institution that is under siege with the economy and, and, and tremendous amount of money being pushed into it to keep it shored up, to keep the lights going, to keep the electricity on, at a time when we have such a need, again, of this nimble kind of risk-taking energy and enterprise, and there's a real gap in the infrastructure and how we actually fund that, how we actually make that happen in dollars and cents. So, Rob, I jump in. I wanted to hear um, from you and then also from Rita in the parallel of assets versus obstacles, the, the fundamental piece of the architecture of public broadcasting is a local station, a local yep. entity. Um, and there's a lot of ways of thinking around and beyond that, but what is that role um, going forward? Yeah, that's, that's actually where I was going to follow up. I think there's a couple of things to be said. I mean, again, I want to reiterate, I, I came from the digital media world where I had no ability to uh, transmit. And now I'm working in public broadcasting where we do have the ability to transmit. And that's a really incredibly efficient thing to do. You build a tower and you sink some costs into that, but the cost of adding more clientele to the get that signal is pretty much zero. Um, you know, you, you, the cost to transmit to one is a cost to transmit to a million. And that is not true. That's not the same scale in digital media. Um, and so those local institutions, all of that, those local organizations, are truly these amazing anchor institutions in their community. You know, they have the ability to collaborate and to curate. They have the ability to uh, work with the local community in new ways and provide content and broadcast into, uh, into schools, into healthcare clinics, into people's homes. And so I think that um, before we give up on the infrastructure that we spent the last 35 years building, we should realize that there's still a lot of energy and a lot of power in that. And that infrastructure is tied to staff on the ground, as Marita said, in every community in the country, including Marfa, Texas, you know, where there are two dedicated people out there trying to tell the public story. And I think that's a really important, uh, you know, a really important point. I think just lastly, in terms of localism and stations, there is a transformation that's going on in, in those stations. Um, we have to balance really savvy media executives who understand how to run a media operation with people like me who are coming in and who've never run a broadcast media operation and who understand how to do new things in new ways. And there's that balancing point that's important. Rita? You know, I am, uh, um, you know, so, so wrapped up in the notion that our stations are the opportunity we have to provide, an, uh, to provide for voice uh, in our community at a scale uh, that's not really available to us in many other instances. And I find this what I'm dealing with partnerships now with people inside and outside public, traditional public broadcasting. Uh, that question of voice to me is one thing I, I hope we don't see at risk, you know, as we, as we move toward uh, new ways of engaging with the public. Uh, and it's one of the real opportunities I see. Uh, certainly in a local community, uh, with the tools that we have now, we're finding as a station that this is when we can go to Dorchester. This is when we can stop talking about, uh, you know, populations in our community who have no way to talk to us, to themselves, 
uh, I think becoming the vehicle for those kind, that kind of dialogue and shared information is, uh, is very exciting to me. It's very exciting because that's, we can do more of that now than we used to be able to do. And I see that with our local television, you know, our basic black that's suddenly doing live programs, but the, the dialogue is right online, that there are community video uh, reporters, that they're bloggers. Uh, we look at some of what we call the lab open calls, which you're doing locally and then nationally, which are calls for people to upload video, to, to really participate uh, in the dialogue that's, that's being addressed through the other platforms. So I would say that the uh, ability for those local stations to continue to partner uh, with organizations outside of themselves is critical. So it's, um, I want to move from the broadcast portion of the event to the participatory portion of the event. So if you have questions, again, please go to the microphones on the side. And also, if you're watching the stream, I did manage to get online. And if you want to uh, tweet a question in, or we're wanting to open the panel before us, we're going to uh, uh, iterate. Um, so just tweet me, Jake Shapiro, I'm just at Jake Shapiro, and hopefully I'll see you here on the, on the direct message. Um, while, while we're um, gathering at the microphones, I wanted to ask this, uh, a question about the, the business model as a strength. So we've you know, often describing limited resources of public broadcasting and the strains between you know, the undercapitalization of the tax-funded dollars and the, the strains that public television in particular has to do around pledge and, and underwriting and sponsorship. Um, but in some ways, and Kinsey, you were sort of alluding to this, um, that, that um, diversified business model and certainly the direct reliance and relationship we have with people pledging money to support something that they value um, could be seen as a strength. Do you see that actually as something that is a thing that we not only could carry forward but map beyond what we've done so far? I think it not only could be seen as a strength, I'd, I'm increasingly come to appreciate um, just how essential our diversified revenue model is uh, to our independence, to our ability to be able to report without fear or favor, um, and to being able to weather uh, the kind of technological disruption that we're going through now. Um, again, having come from commercial media, um, one of the things that, that you're seeing happen right now um, is the, um, the extreme dependence on advertising revenue uh, really drives all conversations at, at a moment like this where uh, revenues are declining, where they're trying to make adjustments in the business, and um, we're fortunate in, in having a relatively even mix between, I mean, in the case of NPR, it's about 28 percent of our revenue comes from corporate sponsorship, um, a little under 50 percent comes from licensing, which at the station level comes from listener support. Um, and then Licensing the rest meaning um, state fees the stations pay for the programming. Right. Um, and then the, the remainder from uh, foundation and gifts, and a very small proportion in our case comes from the federal government. So um, that may change over time. How that business model translates in, in the digital era remains to be seen. Um, we've got a lot of ideas about how that can uh, happen, but it is absolutely a source of strength. Let's start with the microphone left. Please introduce yourself to uh, me. Eric Wolf uh, from PBS, actually. Um, but this is actually more of a, a uh, personal, personal question, personal background. Um, Eugene, in his talk, talked about the notion of public media as a source of um, social cohesion, I think, or societal cohesion. Um, the media today is more and more fragmented, right? The right listens to Fox, the left listens to MSNBC, Somebody else listens to CNN. People, people go into their corners and listen to what they want to hear. Um, can you all talk about how you see, and Marita, I think you just started to maybe touch on this, how you see public media being, uh, having an opportunity to provide societal cohesion as we get into a more and more fragmented world? Yeah. I, uh, we, work hard, we work hard not to be put in, in a box. Uh, uh, and I think it's essential that we maintain that, maintain that as we move forward. Uh, if there's if there's any box we're trying to get out of, it's the it's the tone of voice box. You know, it's the it's it's the creative box. It's the grammar box. Uh, that's a I very, don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> that that's a different box from the um, you know how we are being viewed. And I think this point about being trusted uh, purveyors of information is core. Because as media proliferates, yes, you've got five different, six different, ten different things you're looking for. We need to make sure that public media, public broadcasting remains uh, one of your five choices if that's what you have. Uh, 
uh, and people will, will, will I think, um, respond to that as, as the cacophony uh, goes on. So it's our role is to think about how we invite the participation, how we invite some shared, the development of shared space with other communities. Uh, so that it isn't all just us talking, 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 um, but really providing the space for those communities to talk to one another. We attract people, but they have no way to talk to one another. And if we agree with the uh, view that intelligence has been passed out evenly among communities, rich, poor, ethnic, you know, transmediate, whatever, national, um, part of our role is to convene those people who want to bring intelligence to bear on, on some of the many um, uh, issues in front of us, and I think that role for us is being is becoming more possible uh, because of the tools that we have at hand. <coughs> Nolan Bowie again. I'm a uh, former public interest communications lawyer, longtime advocate for public broadcasting. I support both public broadcasting stations here in Boston. I say that as background. As we all know, uh, not all media are regulated in the same manner by government. Broadcasting is much more deeply and widely regulated than all other media. Um, what makes broadcasting different is uh, the legal fiction of um, spectrum scarcity, the so-called scarcity rationale. Uh, Justice Clarence Thomas, in a concurring decision, uh, this summer in August released uh, in a case titled FCC versus Fox, more or less invited uh, a challenge to the uh, broadcast regulation based on an attack on First Amendment grounds. And oh, no, sorry. First Amendment grounds. First Amendment. In, in the Citizens United, the uh, court seems to uh, treat the First Amendment as sacrosanct, almost as if it was absolute. Um, the same rationale, if applied to broadcasting, uh, would probably hold broadcast. This court would hold broadcasting uh, regulation as being uh, unconstitutional. I'd like to ask the panel in general uh, to regard a more consistent way of regulating broadcasting, consistent with First Amendment goals and principles. Uh, what they think uh, should broadcasting not be regulated as a common carrier, first come, first serve, non-discrimination no censorship, and a separation of the uh, owners of the stations or the conduit from content to give everyone an equal opportunity to speak. Who wants to jump in on that one? I'd like to phone a friend. <laughs> <laughs> this is your chance to phone a so you, I know you have some friends in the audience, I Rob. Try, so. I can try. It's the least I mean, I'm no policy person at all. I mean, just very briefly, from a broadcaster standpoint, you know, we have an 11 percent penetration into the American public, and we do that. We do that, you know, by virtue of what we put out. We reflect who we attract as an audience, and I think um, it's, you know, it's clear that we have a tremendous opportunity now in this age that we're in to penetrate beyond uh, the 11 percent. And I think we're all committed to doing that and finding ways to do that using, again, the momentum that we have going right now to reflect a, a more broadly a democratic, more uh, colorful and diverse America. I think that, that, I don't know if that exactly answers your question, but could we yes. do that? Right. So is the question in a way um, uh, when the transition starts and public media is serving perhaps equally or even more so through digital channels that the broadcast that it retains, the spectrum that it retains, should be managed differently than it's currently managed? So that we should actually, you know, once stations perhaps are primarily now serving audiences through digital platforms, um, then the existing spectrum that we've operated in a certain programming approach you're suggesting perhaps might be operated differently. Right. I'm going to switch to the next topic because we don't, I don't think anybody here is ready to jump in. Kinsey, you ready? Okay. Hi, I'm Stefan Demis here. I'm the director of Citizens Market. We're a new nonprofit in Boston, and we're interested in connecting consumers with information about corporate behavior, both large companies and small local companies. Um, my question is really for any of the panelists. Um, we've heard a lot of really interesting things today about how communities engage the public sector, but since you have your ear down to the ground with what communities are doing, 
I wonder if you have any interesting stories about changes in how communities are engaging the private sector. Uh, this might be local plants from large companies or also local companies themselves. Have you seen any shifts or interesting things happening in that area? Thanks. You know, actually, Kenzie, I wouldn't mind prompting where NPR, I mean, I think there's a big focus on accountability journalism. It seems to be the next area where a lot of uh, public media stations are thinking about investing even more resources. And I'm wondering, as not necessarily from NPR or from NPR, what you see about that. I mean, I think there's a, um, there's a huge opportunity at sort of the intersection of data and journalism, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the focuses of, uh, you know, where we're starting to put some energy into investigative reporting and accountability journalism. Um, I was involved in the project, actually, uh, my former employer um, at USA Today, where we did very elaborate mapping of um, the point emissions from um, manufacturing concerns all over the country, and they have to report to the EPA. But the data that comes out is, is virtually unintelligible. I mean, you get um, information about each individual emitter, but you can't draw a picture of, of what's happening environmentally on the ground. And we worked with the University of Massachusetts uh, to divide the country up into one-by-one one squares and, and look at what the actual impact was and look at prevailing winds and, and look at the cumulative total of that and then mapped it against proximity to schools because that's where young kids are for extended periods of the day. And it drew a very different picture uh, it, it took government information on the one hand that was publicly available, but um, for all intents and purposes not actionable in any way, and transformed it into something that uh, provided a series of stories around at an individual moment, but actually lives on today and, and is a continuing resource for those communities to use and, and is a way for them to hold individual corporations accountable. So I think it's just one example of um, a, a different brand of stories, if you will, that we can start developing over time. Yeah, and I would actually address. add two, oh, I must say one. I actually two more very quickly. Um, w one is uh, uh, a lot of focus, well, not a lot, but there's increasing focus on hyper-localism in terms of journalism. Um, mentioned every block. That, you know, ostensibly came from public media and then was went out and, in, through the Knight Foundation uh, and then went into the, into the private sector. But there are other examples of hyper-localism where they're trying, where in Philadelphia, WHYY, Chris Titulo, who's running this project, is one of the premier civic engagement journalists in the country, uh, ran the editorial page at, at um, uh, the Inquirer and worked with the city on helping them structure the budget process with community engagement. And, I, and he said trying to apply those same lessons to working with seven neighborhoods in Philadelphia around how do you get the community to work on both commercial and government solutions to uh, building that community to be a better place. And I think another one I would cite is uh, Lens on Atlanta, which is a project that's out of Atlanta uh, PBS. It's focused on um, a public broadcasting Atlanta, I should say. Uh, which is focused on trying to give a platform to citizens to talk about everything as mundane as in like why is there this huge pothole in my street to what's happening in my community and why I don't like it. What is the great part about that, I think what's the sort of the brilliant part, is that Milton Clipper and the folks at, at PBA are using their journalistic uh, you know, cred to take those stories and those conversations and turn them into questions from a journalistic point of view. It's almost in some ways crowdsourcing community engagement into journalism versus the other way around and asking, so why is there a pothole in this street or why store are you doing these things? So uh, I think those are examples where we're getting a lot of experimentation. Um, what we need to do now is invest in what works and start to build, uh, uh, build capacity throughout the system. So uh, we have another question coming over here on the right. You wanted to jump in? So uh, um, please go ahead. This is, uh, we'll do one more question, and I have one tweet that's come in that I'll uh, pass along. Oh, I can't compete with the tweet. <laughs> um, with hi, the my name is Danielle Martin. And I'm, I'm here from MIT from the Urban Studies and Planning Department, but I'm also from the community media and the youth media world. Um, and I know this come up a couple times that there's a difference between a mediated and an unmediated space, but I wonder if folks on the panel had some opinions about is there a leadership role that public media as is defined by who's sitting at this panel here, could play in, you know, getting people 
to use more social media and community media like public access stations and collective enterprises um, that aren't quite as mediated to have there be more public interest and more legitimacy to those endeavors. I think that's a great question. I mean, it ties a bit to a phrase that Eugene had used, which is this vision of a new public media network, which I think implies a more expansive sense of who we are um, beyond perhaps the entities constituted here, hopefully partnering with and actually helping showcase and, and elevate some of the groups that are doing amazing work in other domains where some of the, both the audience reach, um, the platform and technology, some of the journalistic um, skills and training that can come with it really could help um, I think raise up a much broader segment than we've seen to date. Um, let me throw it to you guys to talk about where you see that as the opportunity. I mean, what is, what is the vision of the new public media network? I mean, I, you know, a lot of, uh, some of that is what we think about when I was talking about World 2.0. And uh, I really think about it as partnerships with groups uh, outside of ourselves who themselves are uh, creating community to really look at individual uh, youth media of Oakland comes to mind just when you, because you talked about young people, but youth media, right? Youth media uh, mm -hmm. who would partner with us on this, or the guys at Bayback or One Economy, or uh, there are people we talk to who uh, whose work, own work could be expanded and exposed and could attract more people because we're partnering. Uh, and in that case, they're the, they're the authorities, not the public broadcaster. The public broadcaster has the platform and the opportunity to really bring people more people to the question. Um, but I imagine, I'm imagining that the kinds of things we could get back are going to be pretty tremendous. Even in our smaller uh, efforts at WGBH, kind of the open lab, uh, open call we did with the uh, NOVA program uh, attached to an Adobe Youth program to really come back and talk about heat and climate change. And I always find that in those sorts of partnerships, the kind of questions, the approach, the perspectives, the whole thing is much enriched. And uh, I see us doing more of that. Uh, and uh, not mm -hmm. less. I think we're, we're moving in that direction. So it's, uh, as a segue for Sue maybe to jump in that question, the, the, the tweet that came in was asking you about how do you recruit new producing talent? Uh, asking me that question? Yeah. Um, well, over the last two years, we've had a 22% increase in, in growth in the organization. And over the last nine months or so, we've begun to actually survey these people <laughs> to say, who are you and why are you coming to us? Um, uh, so, and I'll answer that question in a second, but just to give you some insight and maybe to respond to that question a bit is what we're seeing emerge is 67% uh, uh, of the new members coming are under the age of 34, 55%, um, you know, we're an organization of independence in radio. 55% are primarily oriented to broadcast radio, but we're seeing this growth in online orientation. 30% of the new members coming in are oriented to online. And then there's subcategories of print in other um, sort of forms of media. So in other words, and 25% are non-Caucasian. So we're seeing emerge, um, I think it's kind of, I, I interpret it as kind of reflective of the larger um, world of, of people who are, again, taking tools into their own hands. And, um, and I, I would say that um, they lead us, as Marita is suggesting, they, they sort of had the power to lead us to these other places and these other collaborations and partnerships. And the opportunity and, and exciting opportunity is, for, again, how we create the pathway for this group into the legacy institutions. Um, the, the tweet in terms of recruitment, it's sort of viral. It's sort of, uh, I think it's very much word of mouth um, with our organization. The MQ2 project, uh, we, it was a competitive, um, it was a competitive uh, call out to producers to get grant money, so we reached far and it wide. It always helps to offer grant money. Yeah. The, the, the recruiting <laughs> technique, yeah. if you money, can offer, offer some funding. Offer money, that's a good right. recruitment tool. So um, we're, we're winding down, and I thought I would um, give a chance for the panelists to, to offer some closing comments. One of the things that we didn't really get to touch much on, but has been interesting as it's bubbled up elsewhere, is that part of the landscape that's really exploded over the last number of years as we've been observing the media transition are these other platforms. We're talking about building a public media platform, but here we are with YouTube and with Facebook and with Twitter, clearly enabling a huge amount of public participation, of distribution, of a lot of things that, you know, when public broadcasting was created 40 years ago, we felt was actually the, the thing that was missing that we needed to address. Um, those circumstances have changed. Where do you see, as you think through 
um, on the positive side of public media's leadership role in this, um, where we need to be creating that capacity and where we're really hoping to leverage others who are building those platforms. So just, you can. Yeah, just briefly, I'd just say, you know, um, five years ago, February, YouTube launched and Huffington Post launched five years ago, not, not this month, but recently, and you see the acceleration of those platforms is incredible. I mean, they're I have an eight-year-old, and so they're only five years old. Can you imagine when they get really dangerous? Um, I think that, you know, I think that, that the challenge is, is for public media to work outside of itself and start to uh, innovate with these technology companies and young people and collaborate. Um, and, and it's a very exciting time right now because public media in large measure is excited to do that. So uh, this is going to be a critical couple of years. And in fact, I have to give um, some kudos to Eugene and the rest of the folks at FCC who are really very thoughtfully trying to engage public broadcasting in, in this work. So, you know, one, of, one of the things that struck me coming into public radio is, is the extraordinary loyalty of the audience and, and the level of trust and the extent to which um, people not only have an affinity for what we do as broadcasters and, um, but f potentially for each other. And, and it is, in a sense, a latent network, if you will, of, of people who uh, imagine that they have something in common with others who listen and uh, shared experience, most of which we've not yet succeeded in bringing online. Um, the opportunity in the platforms that you mentioned is to do precisely that and to recognize that our job is, is to make sure that we're connecting people and that we're getting information in front of them wherever they're consuming information. Um, we've seen a shift just in the last year as uh, the percentage of, of referral traffic that's coming in um, from a variety of different quarters. Search is still the highest, but uh, RSS used to be second, and now it's social media that has displaced RSS. So you're moving from sort of a more mechanical distribution platform to one that's based more on individuals and networks. And, and I think that's only going to accelerate. So. And I, I see uh, these, you know, these are tools for us. Uh, that our our work is really uh, our work, um, which has to do with voice and connection and uh, education and dialogue. And these are tools, and the more of them, the better. I mean, it's really how do I use YouTube, and if it's Facebook, how do we use Facebook? So we're content creators, and we're engaged now in, in serious partnerships with people who are, as I said, very much outside public broadcasting. Uh, with our publics, uh, and that's what the excitement is. And I think where we can use uh, whatever's out there, how we adapt and how we structure our content to uh, fit that particular uh, framework, uh, that's, that's fine. That's, that's kind of why we're in the business. Uh, and I, um, I find the partnerships to do that have been very, you know, I, I work with everybody at this table, or Corporation <laughs> for Public Broadcasting, PRX, AIR, NPR, PBS. I mean, uh, there are not that many of us out here. So uh, <laughs> we're running hard. We're running hard, and uh, and and uh, I think are happy to feel that we're now part of a much larger uh, community of people who are also running hard. Uh, so you know, bring on the YouTubes. Bring on the YouTubes. Okay. Well, we'll close. Uh, I suppose with that. Um, thank you to our panelists, and thank you everybody here. Thank you, Chris.